we've really helped and contributed to a lot of positive outcomes for customers who are victims of cyber attacks, need to recover from cyber attack, just looking for a place where they can walk into the UBX house and open the door and they're like, I'm safe. Hello and welcome to episode 80 of Great Things with Great Tech, the podcast highlighting companies doing great things with great technology. My name is Anthony Spiteri and in this episode we're exploring the journey of a cloud service provider innovator that transformed a childhood fascination with computers into a mission-driven venture. This tale begins in a Detroit basement loaded with servers and evolves into a global entity leveraging cloud technology for operational excellence for their customers. That company is UBX Cloud. Joining me is Stephen Panofsky, president and co-founder of UBX Cloud. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Anthony. I really appreciate being here. It's quite an honor, actually. Oh, thanks very much. And before we get into it, I, I love what we're going to talk about. We were in the pre-show and I'm really excited about your story, talking about UBX Cloud, but also just talking about some really important trends in the industry at this point in service provider land. So before that, though, if you like great things with great tech and would like to feature in future episodes, you can click on the link on the show notes or go to gtwgt.com Head there and view all the episodes or you can go to YouTube, hit the link and subscribe button, the like and subscribe button even, or go to the podcast platform of your choice, Apple, Google, Spotify, all hosted and distributed by Spotify Podcasts. All right, Stephen, with that, let's let's get into it. And again, like I mentioned to you in the pre-show, um, I'm excited to get back to the roots of the show, which is service providers. It's been a while since I've had a service provider on the show. This is why the show exists. Service providers doing great things with great technology. It's it's what I love talking about, right? So <laughs> before we get into UBX Cloud though, give me and give the listeners a little bit of a background in yourself and how, you know, you're, you're self-confessed geek. I think it's, it's, it's pretty obvious to, to, to sort of see. I love that because, you know, so am I and it's great in the space. But give us a little bit of background about yourself and how you became to, to start UBX Cloud um, with a friend of yours, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Um, the, the the history is, uh, is is quite interesting. I'm, I'm, I always seem to fall into things, right? Um, so in 1996, I, uh, I myself and a childhood friend uh, just kind of developed a love affair with um, you know all of technology as much as we could get um, uh, on Packard Bells. Actually, this is one of the Packard Bells that we first oh, look started at that. our that's awesome. journey with. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we just loved everything about it. I mean, we couldn't get enough of it. We would meet up, uh, on, on weekends at church and, um, every time we would have a new story or a new, new thing that we read and we wanted to share with. And, um, that was, uh, my, that was like cemented the friendship between me and Igor. Uh, we were childhood friends. We're, um, we're both, um, uh, Macedonians, first generation growing up in, uh, in the States. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, this is like all new frontier stuff. Like we were, we were wanted to learn as much as possible. Um, internet wasn't really a thing. BBSs, bulletin board systems were mm -hmm. probably, um, you know, the gateway to, to the internet for us. You know, it was like what started it all. And um, uh, with, with me and Igor, it was, uh, yeah, Packard Bell and, uh, you know, learning as much as we could. And we turned, you know, we turned our, we wanted to learn about Microsoft products. You know, Linux was like pretty new. We wanted to learn about yes. Linux, you know. So we started, um, you know, building out a home lab and uh, we had uh, systems and hardware that was donated by by some of our friends and their parents who were working at like General Motors, uh, EDS. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And we had, um, you know, we were like, yeah, give us all of it, you know, and like we will learn from it. And, um, you know, he and I, uh, we're, our minds are just very different, but we both um, kind of... Uh, put that together and just made something awesome with it. I um I remember it, interestingly enough I actually come from a restaurant family. So I uh my family is almost three generations uh in the restaurant business. Okay. Um, and uh, they brought a lot of the specialty um uh, cooking and uh, and the recipes from uh, Macedonia which is uh uh, very similar to Polish food. Uh, you uh, know, I'm a big Polish big fan a big fan of that type of cuisine for sure without oh, question. So yeah. So we we brought that my 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 grandfather um, uh, brought that in and you know we we they've had a successful restaurant business um, in the greater Detroit area and uh, multiple locations and everything, and um, I you know I worked the family business but I was like when I came home to that Packard Bell or when I looked at that thing and I walked into a data center I'm like this is what I want to do, mm. um, 
there was a customer at the restaurant that was like, hey, he's like, you like computers? And I'm like, yeah. And he was a regular. And this was back in the day when you could smoke. And, uh, you know, <laughs> there was a line of smokers in the front and they're all smoking and drinking their coffee. And he had like a, uh, a trench coat. He worked for a local ISP. And he's like, Whoa. you like computers? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, he's like, come with me. He's like, I'm going to show you where all the computers are. And I'm looking at my mom. I'm like, can I go? Yeah, right? That's pretty interesting. Like I would have thought maybe, you know, is this guy a little bit dodgy? Like trench guy yeah, asking, you know, ask, asking a kid or a kid like to go exactly. with him? Yeah, yeah, okay. I thought about that too. I like in retrospect, I was like, you like let me go with like some random stranger. <laughs> like, like, you know, and she's like, ah, he was a regular, you know, he's fine. Hey, dude. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and he drove me to um, uh, the data center. It was uh, the 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 facility was uh, was called BigNet. It was a uh, it was a local dial up ISP, yeah. and um, he brought me in. And there was like a it was like a retail counter in the front, and then there was a safe, and then they opened the safe, the vault doors, and in the vault doors were cabinets with beige servers. I was, was going to uh, say, is it like the the because that time time it would have been potentially the 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 ISP side potentially was going to be rows of literal modems connected up together potentially as well. Like that's what you that's what you would dial up into, right? Yep, they were um they were US robotics exactly oh, what you, you just go. mentioned. Yep, yeah. and um I was like scanning the room and the excitement never left me after that day. After that smell of the glycol in the air and seeing that data center, I was like, I want to do this forever. I, it's interesting <laughs> you talk about that feeling. And I've just, I've, been, I've just been transported back to around about the same time, 95, 96, when my, my mate took me to one of the first internet service providers here in Australia or in Perth called PSINet, never forget the name. And we went mm -hmm. in there and I just remember the smell, the tech they had, like it was just that different world. And they had this thing called Ethernet that was a really fast internet connection. I was like, well, this is amazing, you know? So I, th I think you and I probably had that same feel of, of that. And I've just got transported back in time. And it was a great feeling that kind of, you know, I know solidified my love of technology as well and the internet because it was so new and fresh back then. Very much so. That's wonderful. And that's exactly how I felt. And I turned down a lucrative restaurant empire, right? Like sons inherit, like that's kind of the thing yeah. in our culture. So it's like, uh, mm, I'm okay. I'm I'm gonna do this because I really like doing this all the time. And yeah. uh, and that that was in the '90s, right? Um, yeah. So talk about how that evolved. Like obviously, you know, and we've we've got the garage story happening here, but yeah. you've, you've got you've got your origin story of the love of computer with Igor and and what you guys yeah. are doing. But how has that translated to? setting up something that's going to become UBX cloud in the future. What was the transition and the steps there? Oh yeah. Good point. So um, I worked for um, back in, back in the nineties, you know, internet was, was not that common, right? It was, uh, it was more perceived as like, a, you know, uh, almost like a luxury at that point and not accessible. So I worked at a coffee shop um, just north of my home, and um, I uh, they they was a it was a cyber cafe. So you, you were, were gonna say I was gonna say yeah. you're gonna say internet cafe. Yeah, awesome. Yep. So it was like the two things that I love: internet, technology, coffee. coffee. Right. Love so it. it it was the greatest thing ever. Um, and uh, I I we worked there, and my uh, my boss. Interestingly enough, like everyone on the staff's name was Steve. Like there was like five <laughs> Steve there. Um, so my boss, boss Steve was like, uh, hey, you're pretty good at Photoshop and you're pretty good at like, uh, you know, HTML and stuff. He's like, why don't you teach our, our web design class on, on Fridays? And I was like, OK, like totally I can do that. So I would um, I would teach uh, design fundamentals and um, and just basic HTML for constructing like personal websites and stuff. And um, this was around the time of like this. This was actually even before like GeoCities and like Tripod yeah. and some of those other sites. And um, uh, it, the, he had a really, like, there was a lot of interested people. And uh, at the end of our sessions, like we did a couple, um, I think there were a few weeks uh, long on the week on Fridays, people would be like, hey, okay, I finished my website. We give them like the floppy disk or whatever with the HTML stuff on it. And like, okay, like, where do I put this? Uh, <laughs> right? yeah, like, I can, where see, I can say where this is going. I can say where this is going. Yeah. So I, um, I actually asked my boss, I said, look, there's a lot of people asking, um, you know, why don't, why don't you guys uh, like put this on your, your servers and stuff? Because they're an ISP. Like the Cyber mm. Cafe actually was the local ISP there. Wow, there you go. Okay. And that's how they were able to, to serve all those internet connections at their coffee shop. And uh, he's like, you know what? He's like, we sell, we sell dial-up minutes. That's it. You know, and coffee. Like he's like, we don't do any kind of anything. And um, 
I was like, well, do you mind? And he actually, I think he suggested, I think he said, well, don't you have those like servers at home? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do, you know? And uh, he's he was totally cool with it. So we ended up um, just moving a lot of those customers uh, naturally, right? Yeah. And um, it got to the point over time where it was like, we got like, as these technologies are evolving, their needs were evolving. So like, hey, you know, we want email. Can you do email? You know, and we're like, yeah. hey, like, you know, we, we have Linux servers and we have Sun and we have uh, Compaq back then. And I was like, yeah, we can do all of that. FTP, yeah, no problem. And it was just us learning, right? And then it kind of got to a point where like, we're like looking at each other and we're like, this is like a business now. Cause we ended up having to like, our servers were like, our, my basement looked like something out of NORAD. I mean, it was like, people would, would, would see my basement and they're like, what is this? Like, That's this is so crazy. Cool. Yeah. Do you still yeah. have pictures? Do you still have pictures of those like hanging around? You know, I'll, I'll get, no, I have very few pictures, unfortunately. It's a shame, it was, right? Because it would have been cool. Like it's, it's a cool thing to look back on and go, this is how it was. Versus yeah, what it is now. Apparently, you know, being the child of immigrant parents in the United States, cameras were like something that you just didn't do. They were just too expensive. Cameras and photos <laughs> were too expensive. Yeah. I'm not even joking. Like we've got like five pictures of like the entire 1990s. Isn't right? that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So it was, uh, it, we, we had, um, I mean, I remember like we couldn't afford the racks. Like Igor was like building racks out of like spare wood. Right. Wow. Like he got like, like so donated mm -hmm. or he went to Home Depot and like painting on black and stuff. So he like that's just how he worked. Like his mind was just incredible. Yeah. And um, we got to a point where we're like, OK, we need to like co-locate this. So um, one of the things that I was doing is that at the restaurant locations, they had industrial power. They had three phase. So I co-located some of our servers at my family's restaurants. They had good connectivity, battery backup, you know, three phase power. It was a nice little setup. And then I'm like, you know, Igor was like, we need to put this in a co-location or we need to put this in a data center, like a proper data center. And um, that's kind of where it started. Like that was the spark. Um, awesome. And uh, our clients just kind of drove that. Like they, they pushed us and they showed us what they needed. And then we're like, yeah, we can do that. Right. Or like, yeah, we want to do that. So I, I love the story. I love the I love the evolution of just kind mm -hmm. of being there, geeking out, but also then through just being around people that needed certain services and through the web design, it kind of evolved into, you know, we're going to build, build and host out of our garage. And then it's like, well, garage, this is getting serious. Let's pull it out and put it into a data center. And then, uh, you know, from a UBX point of view, that, that, that kind of was incorporated, what, around 2008 timeframe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what, what was the sort of shift that made you go, hey, now we've got to, you know, create UBX and, and kind of make this thing legit? Yeah, like our goal was to, like, we both went to college together. We both graduated from the same university. And, um, you know, our paths were, like, very different. Like, I was I was doing a lot of, like, consulting um, for smaller businesses and working with a lot of local managed service providers. And I was, like, the server backup guy or, like, the server dude or, you know, the rotating the tape kind of person, right? Um, and, uh, and, and, and handling that aspect of it. And Igor was just, like, you know, uh, just rocketing into space with his virtualization specialization and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, but we both had that fundamental uh, core and drive for like servers, like everything that we did in the data center was exciting and fun. And we wanted to do more of that. And, um, you know, in 2008 was like that, that year where it was like, okay, we're doing this, like sign here, right? Yeah. Like this is, this is now a thing. Like it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a real thing before. Now it's a thing. So yeah. Um, and, and like I said, we'd already learned, uh, uh, like we'd, we'd already known of like Citrix technologies and, uh, you know, uh, I think it was a Metaframe back then and mm -hmm. RDS over dial up. And, you know, we were like, we really like enjoyed doing those kinds of things. And, um, we knew that we didn't want to really be like, um, an outsourced IT department. Um, we wanted to be like the back end, back end people, right? Like, uh, you know, the, 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 the radio face, you know, not the Tom yeah. Cruise, right? Oh, that's, so. that's, that's, that's it, yeah. And so, so what, when you started there, or just taking through the first few years of UBX, 2008 mm -hmm. through maybe the first five or so years, what sort of technology stack and partners were you using back then? You mentioned, you know, VMware or uh, virtualization, so I'm assuming mm -hmm. VMware. But in terms of your, of, of your stack, and I haven't asked this question for a while because I haven't needed to because of the different types yeah. of providers, but I used to ask in the early days of the show, like, what, 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 did, you, what did you build on? Like, was it Dell? Was it HP? And... I was kind of interested in the stack that it was because they were all kind of people were doing it all kind of the same, but it was slightly different, you know. And you, you've mentioned that you you would look at other service providers to get 
a bit of influence or a bit of yeah. idea ideation and we all kind of did that right so what was that stack initially and what were you actually offering as services in those early days sure um so we were very comfortable from the from the beginnings with hp and compact i mean compact servers were basically what we started all the uh x86 stuff on yeah. and um and that just kind of evolved like to the point where we were on like first name basis with a lot of the hp people um i had uh, a key fob or not a key fob i had some access to get a key code to get into their depot to just grab parts and leave io ious uh, right how good like is that, that <laughs> it was awesome how, diff right? how different it was how different it was how different it, i mean i'm not even joking i would leave like a yellow like post-it note and be like uh ubx o's <laughs> you know like this this and this like <laughs> send me the send me the bill or whatever and um uh it, it was really great and but we got to a point where um you know uh, we we needed to like do more automation we needed to um kind of evolve that stack like in order for in order to complete the vision um that 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 you know we had set out was like okay we need to not necessarily use what we like but use what's the best for what we need yeah. and um we decided uh, i think that was like 2011 that you know even though i have a love affair with hp that we really needed to go with cisco ucs and um we needed to to do these things to automate the deployments for our desktop as a service yeah I get, yeah, and yeah back then it was like really novel and new and like in 2008 like nobody like we were like the niche right yeah. like we were offering um citrix desktops to a market that had absolutely no interest in citrix desktops right um so the 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 kind of customers that we got were like very unique like, hey, I've got a multi-site construction company. I got people connecting in. I don't want people to drive in and make like you know de deposit their data and like do prints and stuff. So, um, I got I, I I we were like in that space with like those kinds of requirements. Yeah. And um, we also had a lot of uh, questions. Like people were just like, look, my cabinets are filling up with servers, and I have no place of managing them, or, or I don't have enough power Perfect. or heat. Yeah. Yeah. Contain them. So yeah. um, that was basically the the building blocks and the core fundamentals of what we did. And um, uh, on the uh, on the stack side, uh, we never compromised on storage. Like that that was a thing. Um, we even early on, uh, we 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 spent we were EMC partners. We spent a ton of money with EMC, and um, you know uptime was awesome. Yeah. But the workload, the the arrays were just not designed for for uh, recomposing desktops and the kind yeah. of yeah. What what were you running? Were you running VNXs or something a little yeah. bit more? Yeah, so v, I'm a, we we were VNXs as well. So um, and I went, they ran beautifully when they ran beautifully, but when they fell, they fell hard. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, they 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 were very really, very much so very hard, right? They were either you got everything or you got nothing. I, yeah, a lot, lot of lot of good times, a lot of pain with them, but yeah, I, I know what you're talking. I knew exactly where you were heading at with that with mm -hmm. that sort of line of thought there. So what, what, what yeah, so what did you guys do to kind of get over that? So we ended up um, settling on a technology that didn't really have, uh, there wasn't actually a formal stack. It's called Flash Stack now, but that's actually what we had done back then. So uh, a couple things, um, we we became an ISP, like a legitimate ISP. And, um, you know, that was like at the time I felt like it was a little overkill. Like, why are we, why are we doing this? Right. But I understood later on that it was really important to maintain that supplier quality. So it was like we became an ISP. You know, we 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 manage our own uh, global ASN and we manage our own upstream peers because we can't rely on other people to give us crappy transit, right? Like that was really it. Um, it's our product, right? Like, uh, you know, we can't compromise on that. So we became an ISP, but we, you know, I, I like to say like we're not like a traditional ISP. Like we're not evil, right? Because I, I feel like. In our profession, like telco and ISPs are like on this side of the fence, and like, absolutely no on that side of the fence. Absolutely, um, they're, net they're network guys. Um, yeah, Let let's just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, without, without insulting them too much. Yeah, yeah, it's. It, it, I mean, no, no. I mean, I, I think that just the industry is just very different. Like, yeah, um, you know, it as well. Yeah, it, they're like you know they're like doggy dog. Like they're they're just yes. not our kind of people. No. Um, so it was like okay, we need to control the supply chain, and we did that. And uh, on the storage side, we we were actually the first company to buy pure storage. Um, we were like, take our money, right? Like, hey, yeah. I added, I, I went through all the couches and I got like this huge amount of money, and we're gonna buy all flash. And uh, that's cool. We, yeah, we were their first customer. Um, we were their first customer in Michigan. Uh, they quote unquote popped their cherry on UBX, which I thought there was really go. cute. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, not, and, that's uh, very that's very pure storage as well, by the way, to, to actually say something like that in the early days. <laughs> very, very, very much pure storage. But you know what? Those guys are amazing. I mean, like, really, it was like, look, we put all of our VDI workload and all of our mixed IO workload on there. And I'm like, dude, it just works. Like, this is like, we don't have to do anything. Like, it's doing its thing, right? Yeah. And people were like calling us up and they're like, something's wrong. <laughs> we're like, what do you mean? It's running too fast. These aging reports that take like week it like like four or five days are coming up in like a you know in one day. Yeah, what have like, you done? What have you done? Yeah. Yeah, we migrated you over to pure. Like all of our existing customers, we made a decision, and I thought this was really cool of us. We're like, hey, we're not gonna charge you for this. We're moving you to this storage, right? Cool. Yeah. And any new um, you know, net new customers, then you know, obviously we would uh we would change the pricing structure a bit. But yeah, we gave them we gave the ones that were with us from the beginning like the benefit of that. And I and I like that. Like we yeah. were able to do that. And pure Pure has been amazing, right? Like I, I actually pocked Pure as well in, in Australia, and it was just some things didn't quite work out. But I, I saw the the brilliance of it, right? And and what it what it offered. Um, and if we could have, I think we would have. But we were just too far invested in, in other technologies and partnerships at the time, and just couldn't make it work. And when you look at where Pure Pure's journey and where they are today, I mean, they're they're at the top of their game today, even more so than what they were, right? So it's like we're talking about a journey of now ten plus years for them. But they're still stronger than ever, and I think it's because of the foundations of what they did. It's, it's it was so different. But other people were trying to do what they did, but they just executed on it perfectly. Um, and so, yeah, it, it was a good partnership for you to strike up with for sure. Yeah, and like I said, I it was like completely like it, it was a very natural kind of relationship, and um, and they solved every single one of the storage challenges that we had literally overnight. That's and awesome. they their vision like with the on our end, it was like, I felt like we were really visionary on a lot of the cloud services. And I think that we still are. Yeah. Um, but for them, it was like, they were like 10 years ahead of everything, right? Mm. Like we were like five years ahead, they were 10 years ahead. So it was, yeah. it was really awesome. And um, they've been really supportive of us. Like uh, yeah, when we, when we made our move into India, uh, we were well, again, their first customer in that market, you know? So it was like, we did a lot of, we did a lot of, um, you know, the company that we keep is, is really meaningful yeah. and, and a part I'll, of our corporate. I want to quickly talk about that because I think that is, I mean, we're running quickly running out of time but i want to talk about india because then you're a global footprint right so what made you go to india apart from the obvious it's a growing region expanding all that kind of stuff yeah well i saw um i, I worked uh, very closely with uh with one, a brilliant systems engineer at the, at the time muhammad ali and i developed a 10-year relationship with this guy and, and he was uh, from south india and um I, I just, I never met a mind like his before. And I was just like, working with him was just like, like a waltz, right? Like just a beautiful dance. And um, he saw like, he, he handled a lot of, um, uh, he, he did a lot of work on storage uh, systems and he did a lot of work on backup systems. And he was just a fantastic Microsoft architect. And he worked for us for a long time. And I said, hey, I really see a lot of opportunity in India, but I would never like I'm not comfortable with really opening up a business or expanding into that area, um, just because I'm President Gringo. I'm like you know I'm, I'm I'm sitting here in Detroit. I've got no idea what's going on over there, right? Like, and um, I have no idea. If, like I just see the market potential. Like I see the need, and um, I go if I I go if we if we build our if we expand our business into that area, like would you be would you be willing to run it? And he was like, absolutely. Wow. And I was so surprised because I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. And within a very short period of time, he went from contractor to employee and now owner. I mean, it was like such a success wow. story for this guy. And um, and a lot of our, our journey um, into India was really just exactly the same kind of stuff that we did and innovated on the U.S. side. You know, awesome. desktop as a service, uh, pivoted into backup as a service. Yeah. And and uh, flash that cloud became a thing, right? And we were we were the pioneers there. And um, Beam service provider, like you know, we we are the backend people that support enterprise IT. Like if you are an IT manager and you're looking, at, you know, to try to find a pathway to the cloud or to journey into the cloud or to you know put the proper workload in the right location and secure yeah. it, right? Like we're that company. Like we we cement ourselves because of our um, our, our level of uh, domain specialty. And we fit very nicely in that kind of uh, arrangement. For for enterprise IT, they leverage us for our expertise in our cloud and our cloud knowledge, and 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 we're very good at those things. And on the um, on the service provider side, uh, the managed service provider side, we 
provide products for them to sell and to and, and to incorporate into their stack as well. So Flash Stack has been wonderful for us, and um, you know we're uh, we're we are all ex excellent at the very specific discipline and area that we do um, at UBX Cloud, and um, and that is brought into the India market, and that expertise comes with it. And when we got there, it was like you guys got to throw out all this bad legacy, like juju stuff you got going on here. Like all this is not going to help you when, when, when you're ransomware, when you're hacked, you know, like, yeah. um, have you tested a backup? You know, your server is like a hundred years old, you know, like having these conversations and, and now like, uh, we've been five years in that market, I think on the six now. And, um, it's the same, like I said, it's the exact same as, as, as the, as the, the U S market was, uh, early on. So that's awesome. Let, let's let's actually carry on with that because let's talk about the evolution of, you know, you know, you mentioned Veeam as a partner. Thank you very much for that. Obviously, <laughs> you know, um, but building a service on there and putting and putting a lot of effort into that backup as a service tech and and what that means and what it means to customers, but also how that's evolved into cyber and a, and a generalized, uh, holistic approach to solving a problem today, which is increased, you know, cyber attacks, malware, um, crypto ransomware, whatever it might be. So how, how, I know you've got some very specific thoughts around the evolution there. So spend a couple of minutes talking about that and how, you know, UBX have become, uh, have had to become experts in this field to help yeah. customers and, you know, what, with the technology stack that you've got as well. It, it, that's a really good point. I mean, um, we being a, you know, we're not a, we're not a public cloud provider. We're not providing you just utility, right? We're providing you our flash stack and our, and our experts, right? So that's kind of the differentiator there. And it, back in 2016, um, uh, you know, we we were handling a lot of our um, Beam customers, their backups, their 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 backup and their DR, and a lot of the business continuity components of the Beam service provider environment, which we managed. And um, you know, uh, two of our largest customers, our largest MSPs, got hit by the Kaseya uh, ransomware attack. You know that. They weaponized uh, the Kaseya. Um, uh, they 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 used the RMM tool for the first time. Like this was the mm. first time that this has happened. I remember um, that one. Yeah, and I'm like on Reddit, like, oh my god, like has anyone seen this? We've got like thousands of clients with thousands of servers being encrypted, and like it's all happening all at the same time. Like, how is this even possible? Like all over the planet, and um, this was a success story for us and for Veeam because eighty percent of those impacted uh, servers that were encrypted, physical, virtual, whatever, um, they were using our UBX's uh, Cloud Connect. You know, they were using our environment and we restored them into full operation in like no time. And we were amazed at how fast everything was. We were doing cloud restores faster than the MSP could do local restores. And that like blew my mind and that blew yeah. all of our minds. And um, those were like probably the hardest few weeks um, just, you know, uh, helping that customer and helping them come out of it. I, I was, you know, I'm, I'm on site, I'm taking calls on behalf of the MSP and I'm assuring their customers that everything's going to be okay. Right. Like everything's fine. Like, you know, we're good. Yeah. Pretty and, serious situation, but coming out on the right side of it because of the tech stack and the processes and the, and the, and the architecture that you guys have put into place as well. Yeah, and you never anticipate a scenario in which all of your customers are calling you at the same time. Yeah, that's right? worst case, right? That's like that's yeah, that's, worst that's, case. I would have, I would have packed my bags, Fiji. There you go, done. <laughs> and I and and that's the thing though too is that we were so specialized and we knew like Veeam is the tool in our toolbox that never let us down. I mean, honestly, that that's it. Um, it, it's like the Swiss Army knife that when you like wave it over the box and say, okay, what is this server? What is this backup? It's going to show you the tools that you need to recover it. Right? It's not just going to leave you another box that you've got to unpack and put it away. So that Swiss Army knife and, and that that technology is what helped us recover all these environments. And we have so many stories like this. It's actually yeah. like I'm probably I probably forgot more that we recovered. Yeah. Um, you know, than 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 I can remember at this point. But that was that was a big one. And um, we have a history of using Veeam for like a lot of off-shelf uses for like emergency migrations ransomware attacks and they, the customer needs to get the environment out of there right or or recover the environment and um and 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 it's always been that like that trusty tool and um the thought the engineering you know the the evolution of the product and you know, it's 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 just been hand hand in hand it's it's incredible it's, and it's, it's funny yeah I was, 
sorry to interrupt. I was, I was no, saying, you're fine. Just saying, it's funny that I kind of don't probably appreciate that as much as I used to being on, on this side of the fence. Like mm-hmm. when I was on the other side of the fence, I remember, you know, being amazed. It's like, oh, thank God we've got, I remember, you know, being cryptoed a couple of times or Cusser being cryptoed a couple of times and, um, you know, they've got a four terabyte VM, but we're doing instant, we're doing an instant recovery of the machine, getting it up and running. And at least they've got their servers back up and running because of the technology. And I used to appreciate a lot more, I think, than what I do now because I'm not, it's, it's not impact me, impacting me in the same way that it used to. Um, though I love hearing the stories about that. And it almost makes me slightly wish, not really, but slightly wishes that maybe I get back into that side of the game and get, get that feeling that I had of just mm-hmm. knowing that we're going to be okay. Because yeah. we've, we've architected, and not just from a, I'm not just talking about, you know, talking about the Veeam point of view, but I'm talking about architecting everything and knowing that we've got the Cisco UCS, the pure storage, the flash, the networking's in play. Everything that we've built and architected gets us to the point where we can go to a customer and say, we can recover you with confidence and hey, don't worry. Like that's, that's what you want. And as a, when you're offering a service and building a business around this, this is what you want to have confidence in. So yeah, I just thought I'd mention that. It's really interesting and great to hear it as well. Absolutely. And, and when you mentioned like the flash stack, the resiliency with that, with that part of the stack as well, like the backup is one thing, but the production environment is another. Yeah. Um, pure storage was, you know, we have the data immutability feature on snapshots, like good luck deleting the snapshots, right? Um, there, there's all these uh, hooks and technologies on the storage end that are completely independent of the backup side, but still serve the purpose of that. Let's yeah. make sure that things don't get destroyed. The whole approach. And, um, yeah, the whole the, the entire holistic approach, and um, uh, on the uh, on the Veeam side, you know, leveraging um, all that goodness, uh, and 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 you're right, like the the wild west aspect of it. Like I remember, we we called uh, Veeam support up, and um, you know, those crazy Russians on the other end back then were like, "Hey, I'm like, hey, can we can we restore a 250 terabyte physical machine into a VMware cloud over the wire?" And yeah. the guy's like, uh, let me check, hold on. And he comes back and he's like, uh, you try to restore and you let <laughs> us know. <laughs> I'm not even joking. Like that, I was like, okay, yeah, we'll try it. Well, because like that I was that we were validating if we could. And you want to know what? Yeah. We did it. Yeah, that's we awesome. did a P2V uh physical to virtual conversion over the wire during a storage fabric failure. Uh, on the client end. So their entire storage fabric was just falling apart. Um, the company, it's, it's the, this is another long story, but um, the company went out of business and they told their customers to leave and they had 150,000 servers. Yeah. So we were evacuating all this customer's environment, wow. these poor, poor clients that were just stuck there. And um, we did that. That was like the biggest VM we ever P to V. And that's and a massive. That's a massive VM as well, just quietly. <laughs> yeah, I have the screenshot. I've got to find the screenshot because I was oh, like, yeah, that? that's one of those cool things, right? Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, just to finish off. Uh, speaking of VMware and speaking of VMs, yeah. um, just want to quickly, like in in five minutes, just like chat about the VMware scenario, Broadcom, and yeah, you know, how that's impacting you from the point of view of obviously, you, I, I believe you play a couple of sides of the fence um, with regards to you know what you offer in terms of VMware licensing and then your own licensing. So, in a very quick nutshell, what what is it what is it meaning to you? Has it impacted, and what's the reality for customers moving forward? I think that um, it, it's it's definitely a, a strange situation for for a lot of people out there, and just kind of like okay, like this is this is a product that we've used since I was like you know like. 15 years old, right? Like, it's like, you know, so it's like very near and dear to us. And, um, you know, because of the ownership change and, and because of the changes in the in the atmosphere, I still feel that, um, that, that there's still a lot there, especially on the enterprise side with VMware. And um, even though UBX Cloud, it, it's funny, I, I mentioned like, you know, uh, we're like a mullet, right? Like party in the party in the back and, and the business in the front. But like, we do a lot of our labbing on OpenStack and, 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 and we have OpenStack experts on staff and we could, we could very easily, you know, create an, an enormous OpenStack cloud. Yeah. Um, but, you know, really it's like, well, who are our customers? Well, our customers are a large enterprise, right? And our customers are like, look, um, you know, this technology, single pane, it works awesome. There's no reason to leave it, right? Just because there's a little bump in the road here and there, overall, I, I think it'll just kind of even itself out. And from our side of the fence, it's like, okay, well, they're saying, well, everyone's going to, they're all going to rush to the public cloud. I'm like, hey, we're here. 
right? Yep. Um, yep, yep we've yep. got a VMware private cloud and it's flash deck and it's awesome and it's managed by experts and hey, guess what? We're like a lot cheaper than we care, right? <laughs> so it's like, um, so there's the, the value proposition there. And, um, you know, I mean, yeah, we could deliver a, an open stack cloud that would do a lot of amazing things, but, you know, um, there's no reason to change, especially when you have larger enterprise clients that are not willing to make that shift. So yeah. let Broadcom get comfortable in their new position and, um, you know, let them kind of uh, assess the situation. And I think it'll be okay. Yeah. Do you think that, um, do you think that, customers and tenants of VM cloud, oh, sorry, VMware cloud service providers mm -hmm. have potentially been paying for a super premium, super reliable product on the cheap a little bit maybe for the last 10 years. I've been trying to quantify yeah. this in my head. You know, maybe there's a bit of a normalization of what you're actually getting from the point of view of the product. And now there's a real tangible example to, to play it against, which is the public cloud because repatriation was is a thing and was a thing and still is a thing. Mm -hmm because primarily I think of cost pressures, right? So it's super expensive compared to what the private cloud was or the infrastructure cloud was. So could we just be normalizing that to a certain extent, like you, like you mentioned, not completely going the way of the public cloud cost or the hyperscaler cost and mm -hmm. kind of landing somewhere in the middle and enterprises understanding and tenants understanding that it's actually okay. Like I'm, I'm comfortable here because the alternative is probably something that, yeah, cheaper, whatever, but maybe less reliable, less less tangible for my business to be a, a going concern. Because if something goes wrong, do I really want to trust that technology? And I'm not slagging the other technology that's out there completely because yeah. I've had some on the, on the show the last couple of episodes, right? But I think, do you see that as being a potential outcome here, that there's a bit of normalization of the, of the cost here? I think the, I think the re, the come to Jesus and the reality check is really important there when it comes to that. And I think you nailed it. Um, you know, we we've all been using this technology and and it's it's so excellent and so good. But there's so much legacy pricing models. You know, VMware was very much like, ah, eh, it's okay. You know, but in reality, Broadcom is kind of injecting that like, hey, there's a reason why everyone is using this. You want uptime, you know, you want resiliency, stick with this and you're, you're okay to pay for it because, you know, you want that hundred percent uptime yeah. um, or that high uptime. And um, I think that like, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, the other options that are out there, they're all fine. I mean, yeah. really it is, but, but you got to look at it from the lens of the customer, you know, yeah. and, and what are, what's important to them. And um, you know, it, you know, is like VDI is a huge thing for us. So it's like, look, we're, we're, we're invested in desktop as a service and, you know, using those products and using those hypervisors, there's a reason why we're using them. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, good stuff. Hey, finally, just in a, in a, in a minute or so, what, what's next for UBX? What's, what's the next things that you're looking at to sort of innovate on and, and sort of, you know, bring to market? Um, you know, our, like I said, I, we begrudgingly got into cyber in 2016, but, um, you know, we've really helped and contributed to a lot of positive outcomes for customers who are victims of cyber attacks, need to recover from cyber attacks and, um, just looking for a place where they can, you know, they can walk into the UBX house and open the door and they're like, I'm safe, right? We have Veeam, we have pure storage, we have experts like come in, like, we'll take care of you. Here's hot cocoa, right? Yeah. Um, and cookies. <laughs> and, and cookies. Uh, and cookie. Oh yeah, cookies are a big thing. If you go yeah, on YouTube, yeah. search for UBX cookies, you'll see it. You'll oh, see okay. I'm I'm gonna do that now. <laughs> I'll link yeah. to it. Yep. And uh, that's her back there, actually. That's that's that that's our baker extraordinaire. So there she you bakes. Go. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's just um, uh, it's it's very much the the you know having the best in class engineers and kind of very much doing what we do well. And uh, expanding, ex you know, expanding our cloud offerings. Um, we've got a lot of, um, you know, exciting news uh, in 2024 regarding our, you know, expansion into India even more and um, cementing that investment. And then also into new uh, new areas like, um, you know, the UAE, like the Gulf region. Oh, wow. Okay, like, yeah, cool. We see that cybersecurity, um, business continuity, uh, and, and, and private cloud are like, you know, they're really in hot demand there and the experts to run it. So... Yeah, cool. I'm excited. I mean, I get that that same like glycol data center feeling that I get now. I'm actually like, uh, I love you know, that tie I, back. I, I love the tie back. Good, good, great way to end. Hey, this has been a really great conversation, and like I say a few times, but I mean it here. We could have talked for hours. Um, so thanks a lot, 
Thank you for being on. Just as a final reminder, if you like great things with great tech, head to the uh, to the YouTube channel, head to the website, gtwgt.com or at gtwgt podcast. This has been episode 80 of Great Things with Great Tech. Thanks again to UBX Cloud for being on. Thank you so much, Anthony. Appreciate it.